Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Media Boat Podcast. Today is February the 10th, 2021. If you don't know what the Media Boat Podcast is, here's your opportunity to learn. We are a podcast that talks about the newest news, newest releases, and our thoughts about the newest releases of movies, television, video games, and music, not necessarily in that order. And boy, do we have a lot in all four categories to talk about today. My name is Matt. With me is Mike. I'm Mike. He's Matt. We have thoughts in, I think, just about everything. And not just Ew. one thought, but double thoughts at least. Oof. Yeah. How, how are we going to do all this uh, fast? <sighs> I mean, we'll try. We'll do our dar- darndest, I'm sure. Um uh- So let's get started with the film section here. And we always um, start with the box office. Just real quick, little update for you. Little Things is still at the top with $2.1 million. That's sitting as $7.8 million domestic total, of course, not including all the people who saw it at home on HBO Max, like we did. Right, and not including all the people who didn't watch it because we told them, don't watch it like we did. (laughs) Yeah, what's the opposite of a bump, like a podcast bump? So is the, the media boat <laughs> valley, like when we tell people not to do something. It's very uncanny. Oh, yeah. No, you can't, can't distinguish it from a real thing. Um, so in that case, let's move right then all along into movie news. There was some big ones this week. Well, one specific big one that kind of rocked the internet yesterday, which we're going to start with right now. Blue Sky Studios. Quick pop quiz. Do you know what Blue Sky Studios was? It was, because <laughs> now we have to say was, I guess. Yeah. Quick yeah. Um, changing on their Wikipedia page to all everything from is to was. <laughs> the animation division for 20th Century Fox. They did Ice Age. Um, yeah. The Lor- Not the Lorax, the one before it. Horton Hears a Who. Rio, Epic. I think that was their last one. Yeah, I think you're right. So mostly well known for the Ice Age movies, but their fun fact, their history actually goes back further than that. Uh, the Blue Sky name is a was a rename of the studio Rhythm and Hues, which was a visual effects studio that worked a lot in the early days of CG with other studios such as DreamWorks. They had a lot of work on um, early DreamWorks films like Ants, for, exa- for example. Right. Um, uh... I know they did the special effects on several big budget movies. Yeah. I think the biggest one was Fight Club at the time in the early 90s or late 90s. I believe I believe you're right. So yeah, even way back in the late 90s they were turn, they were uh, giving um, other studios like Pixar kind of similar kind of kind of area giving them kind of some competition. Well, competition no more because as you know, Disney uh, is closing Blue Sky Studios. The animation company inherited it back 2019 with its acquisition of 20th Century Fox. That means about 450 employees uh, staffing the company will face termination, though some are said to be eyeing roles, open roles at other Disney portfolio holdings, including Walt Disney Animation and Pixar, but there are no guarantees. Basically, Disney is not moving um, team members from Blue Sky into other animation teams in the Disney uh, web. Instead, they are terminating their positions. Right. It's not a convergence of the no. studios into one another. It's more of a dissolution. Yeah. They're which dissolving. is why, yeah, which is why you see a lot of people angry about this because Disney could obviously have done that, but they chose not to very pointedly. Closure was a foregone conclusion for many in the industry upon the historic Disney Fox transaction. Maintaining a third animation label, as you would imagine, became untenable. For Disney, at least fourth? they're claiming. Fourth? Are we forgetting about Disney Toons? Uh, yeah. At some point, television. Well, that became television, television. animation. I think that's right. what they call it now. Okay. And I want to say that that be that's because that's not a film division. They're not treating it as a film animation. So technically, studio. film division here then. Right. I think they're specifically talking about film animate film animation. Okay. Um. So yeah, it would be Disney Animation, Pixar, and then Blue Sky it would have been the third. So. It will likely see the end for their studio's franchises, including Ice Age, Rio, and one of their most recent uh, films that had not yet become uh, become a franchise, Spies in Disguise. Oh, yeah. 
spies in disguise. It also, uh, this story does not mention it, but this also means that a store, a film that was in production um, has been canceled um, over yes. at Blue Sky. Nali? Naoli? Yeah, I don't remember what it's called. Namalia? Friend of the show, Christy, actually knew what it, this was and knew it's some based of the off people a comic involved. Book or a graphic novel. Yeah. So, um, so, but yeah, so needless to say, that's unfortunate because um, I'm sure a lot of people were hoping for that project to get off the ground and see oh, the light of day. Duh. So they did the uh, Charlie Brown movie. They also did the Charlie to, Brown movie for, um, uh, we'll talk about Charlie Brown later yeah. in TV. Yes, we'll get there. Uh, but yeah, so depressing news all around. Disney obviously had the ability to save these jobs. They chose not to. And especially during a pandemic that looks really lousy. I so, mean, I wonder if that's yeah. one reason why but they could easily just turn this studio into a separate dedicated Disney plus studio. Yeah. And just say, you're now doing all Disney plus shows have at it. There's all sorts of things they could have done, but ultimately they chose the cold business decision version, which was just, eh, shut it down. Chapek you. Yeah, exactly. Who knows who made that call, but you maybe anyway, on to other news. I don't know if it's better news, just other news. It's um, other news. Yeah. Uh, good luck to the 450 employees. Yes, obviously. Hopefully yes. Some of you get um, employed by Disney, by one of Pixar, by another branch very quickly. This is obviously a tough time to be unemployed. Although I couldn't, I wouldn't blame those people if they were suddenly now very disenfranchised by the corporation and wanted to work elsewhere. In which case, illumination. Yeah. There's other options. So good luck to those people. Wait, All that's right. The only other option, Illumination. Uh, no, um, Sony. Sony. Oh yeah, Sony Animation. Sony's on the up, yeah. up in the ups that, right good, now. Uh, yeah. I would right say now. that that's the place to be. Mm-hmm. Um, All right. Well, next up, we have a little bit of another Oscar mm-hmm. update. You're thinking? No, uh, I'm thinking that that's probably the reason why, like, you just saw all the Disney Plus, like, new, new arrivals with all Blue Sky Studios stuff. Oh, I wonder. With like Furman and a just lot of the them out. stuff. Just, just like, all right, we... We're, we're going to take what we want and... Put, put it here. Put everything here, yeah. Yeah. All right, anyway, a little Oscar update for y'all. The first details regarding the Oscar ceremony have emerged, and it will have an in-person show, not just from the Dolby Theater in Los Angeles, but from multiple locations. This sounds also, familiar. Yeah, this sounds like other award shows we've seen. They have also announced a short list in nine categories, including documentary, international, visual effects, and both short film categories. The short list voting concluded on February 5th with the remaining moving on to the official phase one voting, which will take place on March 5th through 9th. The Oscar nominations themselves will be announced on March 15th with the show scheduled to take place on April 25th. We'll have a little bit more about those Oscar short lists in the music section. Yeah, uh, so right now, Phase one's done. Short lists are complete. They're going to tally up the votes and basically send out the second round and sort of will their way down to the what get, decides to be Oscar nominated, Academy Award nominations. Yeah. Still uh, no host, but I do think they're going to see how the Golden Globes do it. Yeah. With the Coast to Coast feed. Yeah, that'll be an interesting kind of experiment. And, and then also with the Grammys doing an outdoor ceremony right. as well. Right. Kind of picking With and choosing. See pre-recorded stuff to put in there. Right. I wouldn't be surprised if you see a pre-recorded approach for the um, best song nominees performances. Yeah. And um, just note that they technically aren't stealing these ideas because <laughs> the director of the Academy Awards typically is either the director of the Golden <laughs> Globes or of the Grammys of other award shows. So it's not like they're stealing ideas. Right. They're just using what they know. Also, they're using what works because that's yeah. the thing. It's like, it's not really stealing if you're just trying to stay safe, you know, the, in the, a production. The great thing is Hollywood, in Hollywood is if you're going to steal, steal from the best. <laughs> that is true. All right. That's it for movie news. So let's go roll right into our thoughts. We watched a couple of movies this week. We watched two different movies this week. Two very, very different movies, I would assume, having not seen the one you watched. Uh, and I have not seen the one you watched. 
All right. Well, which one do we want to talk about first here? The HBO Max premiere or the Apple TV Plus premiere? Well, I teased the Apple TV Plus premiere last week. Okay. Does that mean I go first? I guess go for it. Tell me about a uh, recent uh, internet pariah, Justin Timberlake in Palmer. Pariah? Oh, well, get there in the TV section. We'll get TV there, section? trust me. Movie yes. section? No, the television section. The TV section? We'll get there. Just wait. I, I don't see it. Oh, give, oh yeah. The, okay. I'm For giving that. you a. I'm giving I, you I, a um, a lead in, but we'll get there. First up. Right, so tell me about Justin Timberlake, all serious like. Justin Timberlake being all serious like on Apple TV Plus. He is the <laughs> starring. Uh, basically, it's a starring vehicle for him, Palmer, on Apple TV Plus. So Justin Timberlake, former football quarterback star, former LSU quarterback star gets in trouble with the law and basically throws away any opportunity he has of the grand life he wanted Mm -hmm. and gets sent away for 15 years in prison. Gets out of prison. This takes place as he gets out of prison and goes back to his hometown to a point where he sees all his friends 15 years later who all have families 15 years later who have kids (laughs) who are all grown up. And it's kind of starting to be depressing for him because it sounds like the movie young adult mm, i never saw that one but we'll talk about young adult later (laughs) we will yeah okay or at least diablo cody later oh okay got it um so he's needs to basically start over from scratch and because he is a convicted felon can't really get any work uh, so he takes up, I don't say refuge, but he gets employed at the local elementary school where he befriends, I'm going to throw huge quotes up here because he's the reluctant befriending here, of the family, throwing huge quotes around here, who lives with his grandma who he moves in after being released from prison. The boy, or the son, isn't like normal kids his age because he likes fairies and princesses and plays with the girls and gets bullied and beat up because of it. Nowhere in the movie does it say that he is gay. Nowhere in the movie does it imply that he is gay. It just says that he is a boy that likes this kind of media. Mm -hmm. And as much as Justin Timberlake's character tries to steer him to football, his love. (laughs) He eventually comes around and decides that this kid is who he wants to be and why should I make him be different? Mm -hmm. So that's just the basic premise of it. There's a whole lot of other family drama that goes deep into it and like how messed up the kid's family is, kind of other burdens that get put on Justin Timberlake's uh, plate. And I actually recommend this movie. Hmm, okay. It's weird to recommend it because it's not exactly the kind of ho-hum family dynamic drama that you would probably expect, but it has some very captivating acting. Okay. If you can captivate me and you can make me feel for the characters and make me invested you've done a good job. And this does a good job of making you invested in the characters, making you care for what happens to Justin Timberlake and to uh, the child that he is kind of overseeing and being a parental guardian to. Yeah. You care, you, you're invested. It's very hard to do because you can easily, and they do this several times, try and push the child off and be like, this isn't my problem. I don't want this problem. This is not what I signed up for. But it also is a good job of why this is um, of why like he feels like he's the only one who can basically solve this, be the parental figure that he needs, Mm -hmm. and doesn't want this child to end up in the foster care system and just kind of be lost because he can be bullied. He's not like the other kids. And because 
they form like this special bond between them. It's mm-hmm. a very abnormal family dynamic that works for this film. Do you think this is a springboard of sorts for Justin Timberlake? Do you think this is him signaling that he wants to get back into doing serious acting? I think so because he's pretty good in it. Okay. He has okay. some pretty good uh, dramatic turns in this. Um, Show some real depth of character in his acting, and I would say yes. Okay, I guess that's one reason why it's on Apple TV Plus because <laughs> it is essentially a character piece, a character study. Okay, well that sounds better than I thought it was going to be because the the ads that the trailers that they would show just seemed like okay, Justin Timberlake with this kid, like he's going to be really serious. I, yeah, like, I mean. Okay kind of is he is pretty <laughs> serious he's also like tries to get his life on track and uh-huh. tries to save uh this young boy okay. cool. essentially so uh so recommended to people who have apple tv plus yes but i would not necessarily go out and buy apple <laughs> tv plus to watch specifically palmer right no because we already told all of our audience to buy apple tv plus for ted lasso so they should right. already have so it. if you already have ted, if you already binged ted lasso <laughs> and you've already gone through yeah. uh mythic quest just wait there's another show we'll get to in tv before you can start watching palmer <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll get there but, later i mean dickinson's on there you like that yeah yeah dickinson's good yeah all right so apple tv's Plus, it's actually coming around with some pretty good stuff then. You just That's, have yeah, to no, they're, subscribe they're, to it. They're coming along. It's cool that they give it to you free when you buy an Apple product. It's very convenient. <laughs> uh, well, now I'm, they've got me now paying monthly now. So, but, but for the most people, well, you can that's just the always best buy way a new it. Apple product and just re sign you up. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. I guess it's my turn to talk about this. This will be quick. Uh, so I watched the uh, HBO Max premiere of the new Studio Ghibli film, uh, Earwig and the Witch. Oh, it's a Studio Ghibli. So not only is this Studio Ghibli, but it's notable for being Ghibli's first <clears throat> CG film. It is not hand-drawn at traditional animation. It is a CG version of their kind of style. Is it still directed by Miyazaki? So you're close. Not that one, but his son. Oh. Not the first of the Ghibli films to be directed by his son. Um, actually, he's actually tried to take the mantle um, going forward as um, Hayao Miyazaki's age is getting up there. And so he's not going to be around forever. So also he keeps, you know, retiring and then unretiring and, and then retiring. starting projects and never finishing them. And so, yeah, there are other directors in the pool um, and his son is one of them. And so, yeah, uh, we kind of just watched this uh, on a whim, um, not really knowing a whole lot about the premise, um, but it ended up being a fun kind of watch that absolutely falls apart when you start thinking about it. So real quick, um, basic premise. So this is based on a, sto- a, a children's book uh, written by, weirdly enough, the same author who wrote Howl's Moving Castle, a previous Ghibli adaptation. Um, and it's the story in the film very much feels like that of a children's book. The stakes are pretty low. There's not much that happens and it's all wrapped up in a nice tidy, happy ending package by the end of um, like the end of minute 80. It's very, very short, very, very speedy, very get, gets, gets in, gets out with its characters and just bright colors and all that stuff. So real quick synopsis. So girl, the titular earwig, Um, is an orphan, orphaned by her mother, who you see at the beginning of the movie. Fun fact, voiced by Casey Musgraves in the English dub. She also provides her singing voice for the song that repeats throughout the movie, and it is a jam. It's the best part of the movie, actually. All right, you can stop right there. I'm going to watch it now. (laughs) So, yeah, but just wait. Hold on. You might not want to when I'm done. Um, So, yeah, uh, so she gets adopted, um, she kind like, of has a nice kind of nice life at this uh, this orphanage. She's kind of the self proclaimed leader of all the orphans. Um, she she kind of tells her best friend what to do, and that's kind of the setup is that she's all this, she's this very like strong willed very young girl, um, but she wants to eventually have a home just like every orphan does, even though if she's not outward about it. 
So along comes this weird, mysterious couple. Um, and oh yeah, by the way, it's unclear exactly why at the first, why the mother has abandoned her. It is, you're, the audience is told that there have, has been some sort of witch coven that is following her, the mother, and that she needs to escape from the other witches. And so orphaning, like putting, giving her child to an orphanage is supposedly to keep her safe. Anyway. Um, the Harry Potter so, way. Yeah, very kind of Harry Potter-ish or hunchback-ish where you have the, the scene of the, the kid being dropped off at the place kind of vibe. Um, anyway, but yeah, so she eventually gets adopted, but by a couple who happens to be a witch and a weird, mysterious creature dude. I would say more, but that's a little spoilery. Uh, all you need to know is that the kid and the witch basically hate each other. They have a lot of trials between each other, and there's a lot of chaos that happens. There's a talking cat at one point that helps the girl, uh, helps Earwig try to learn magic. Uh, because that's what Earwig wants to do, because she thinks if she er learns magic, that she'll be able to run the place just like she did the orphanage. And that is literally the st all the story that there is in this film. Oh. Eventually, by the time you get to the end, uh, there is a happy ending, and you get, you get a minor reveal about what happened to her mother, who was also in a rock band with this other witch. That sounds awesome. Sounds awesome. But again... That's all you get. Oh, you just get told it. You don't. You get show like explore. there's a little bit of visual <laughs> stuff with it, and but like generally speaking, that's all the story really has to offer is this one scenario where girl is like the like mom leaves for mysterious circumstances, and then you have the dynamic between the the girl and this family that she's found herself in, and. There's a little bit of a character arc with the with the, the dad slash monster, but ultimately the girl kind of ends up at the end of the movie being in charge just like she wanted to. Spoiler. And that's it. Hmm. Like both Christy and I were kind of like, wait, that's the end of the movie? Like, what? And mom comes back again. Spoiler, but whatever. It's so low stakes and so nothing really happens of note it's a pretty looking movie at least i think so a lot of critics on the internet are saying that it's not and don't like the look at this thing at all i think it's a pretty good analog of the stuff that ghibli does with hand-drawn put into cg it doesn't look as good because it's really hard to replicate the craft of hand-drawn animation in the same way especially anime um but I think there's enough fun visual stuff happening that if you're looking for that, you'll get it. And also, I think what one of the things that Ghibli is really good at, even in this film, is world building. Like, you do see a lot of cool things in the backgrounds of every scene. The magic spells do interesting things visually. Um, Earwig's uh, animation of her face is probably one of the coolest things in this film because it's, she's very expressive and does really unique takes depending on how she's reacting to everything around her. And so there's stuff in here that I would recommend, but ultimately it's all over so quickly and the story just doesn't go many places that it's very easy to get to the end of it and feel very underwhelmed, even with it only being an hour and 20 minutes. So more of a kid's movie then. It's definitely, that's why I kind of led with the based on a storybook thing, because it feels very much like a storybook that you read once and you're like, okay, well, that was nice. Oh, well, that's too bad. I mean, I guess yeah. I might check it out because Casey Musgraves. Yeah, the Casey but, Musgraves yeah. song is really good. She's not in it very much, but you do hear the song over and over again, okay. which is nice. Uh, kind of more in the background than in the front, <clears throat> but you do eventually get the performance later in the film. Um, but it's really hard for me to recommend. And I'm actually feeling okay with it. If you read some of the reviews, there are a lot of harsher takes. Okay. People are routinely panning this thing. I think the Rotten Tomatoes is around 33%. Oh. Yeah. Ghibli? People, and the problem is, is that no matter what you're going to do, if you have a whiff, it's a Studio Ghibli whiff. And you're mm -hmm. always going to be comparing it to the greats of that studio. So if you go in expecting a spirited away, you're going to be really disappointed by what's here. So expect it more like Cars 2, where it's a fun romp <laughs> for kids. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just go in thinking, okay, this is going to be a fun way to kill 80 minutes. And I have my 10 year old here with me and we want to watch something like that's the vibe. Don't okay. go in expecting a deep story with meaningful morals or anything. In fact, it's kind of a lack thereof. Uh, Christy actually pointed out at some point that she's like, wow, if you uh, at any point think this is a metaphor for like the cycle of abuse, then this movie has a really awful message. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I don't think they were thinking about that when they wrote this. Um, and we don't know how much of that is the original story or the adaptation. So uh, Christy actually found the original book at the library and she's gonna uh, <coughs> check it out and read it to see how much of it was existing material. So. Sounds good. So yeah, uh, it's not great. Sounds like a pass. Uh, but it sounds like it's it's I'll say it's a pass for most people unless you're in like an hardcore animation person who wants to see the newest Ghibli thing. I'd say check it out. It's a harmless 80 minutes. So if it's only 80 minutes, it's good to go by fast. It's it's quick. Okay. It's very uh, fast paced, too. So it'll be over before you know it. But yeah, I not not a great. So yeah, I guess that means HBO Max counter of the uh, direct to oh, HBO Max thing. That's three, they're three <laughs> for three duds right now. Wow. Come on, what are you doing HBO Max? Well, they did have the flight attendant, which was right before those. So Yeah, but that's that not a good. film. No, you're right. That was you, I'm, I'm just talking specifically movies. They're not. Like between Wonder Woman, Little Things, and this, this is the third time in a row. Well, that's okay. We get Tom and Jerry at the yeah. end of the month. Fingers crossed for Tom and Jerry, I guess. <laughs> okay, no, no, before that, uh, before we get to Tom and Jerry, uh -huh. uh, heads up for next week, um, Judas and the Black Messiah mm. dropping on HBO Max this weekend. Right. Um, supposed to be um, highly rated, um, potentially Golden Globe winner, Academy Award Best Picture nominee, probably. But that's dropping on HBO Max this week. Okay. But it did get a limited release in order to count for yeah. this upcoming Oscar season. Well, uh, we'll keep tabs on that one and we'll keep you all updated if that is any good. But before that, let's move on from thoughts, unless you watched any other movies before we can move on to Sports Corner. I watched Dune, which is available on HBO Max, <coughs> ahead of the release of Dune on HBO Max. Okay. Not not new release. <laughs> no, so that doesn't count. No, but it starred Kyle McLaughlin. Yes, that Kyle McLaughlin as a kid. Yeah. So that was really interesting to see. Yeah. All right. Well, in that case, let's move on into the sports corner, where we always start our television section. And yeah. you don't have it listed first, but we got to talk about it first. Let's talk about Super Bowl 55 that happened on Sunday. It was the big TV event, brought in 90 something million dollar um, million people watching it. So needless to say, it was a big deal. The biggest story in sports this week. We will talk about the uh, halftime show probably later. Yeah, uh, I have that but, written down for thoughts. But as for the game, uh, yep, your Tampa Bay Buccaneers won the Super Bowl 31 to nine in a very frustrating game full of penalties and just disappointment all around for the Kansas City Chiefs. So that means that Tom Brady is now a five-time Super Bowl MVP. He has seven rings? Yes, he has seven rings, which is more than any other NFL franchise. Which uh, ties him with Ariana Grande. <laughs> yes, because I saw hashtag seven rings trending. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. How'd you feel about the game? Because that's kind of how I felt. Just, just a frustrating game. It was good in the game. first half. Yeah, like no, it was really half. entertaining when it was close. And then when they pulled ahead more and more, I was just like, which is I grew what more I said anxious. last week that yeah, if you give Tom Brady a two touchdown lead, you're not going to see him again. Even you know, even with a quarterback like Mahomes, who's known for comebacks, just could not pull one out of his hat. No, but Mahomes was injured. He did get <laughs> surgery on his foot literally yeah. two days later. So he wasn't 100% there. Right. That being said, he was still running around in the quarterback oh, yeah, in, no. in the pocket and scrambling the... and couldn't like set yeah. up for a throw. Well, that was one of the most frustrating things is that Mahomes actually was really good throughout and it wasn't his fault that he couldn't that he couldn't score. It was the fact that freaking just the yeah, Too the, many the drop defense balls, and then there's a lot of penalties on yeah. the city which 
Okay, to be fair, I didn't think a lot of them in the first half were penalties, especially yeah, no. in the last two minutes of the first half. I mean, even at even at um, at halftime, you had the the um, the CBS kind of panel basically talking about like, no, no, this is very clearly favoritism here. Like mm-hmm. they're not calling anything on the Buccaneers side and they're calling everything. They're being super picky about the Chiefs. Right. Tony Romo did call out a few plays ahead of time. So <laughs> that was... Yeah. Yeah. That was funny. <laughs> um, so yeah, not a, not a great game to actually watch. Um, no, not has the Super Bowl been this bad since it was Seattle versus or Seattle Seahawks versus yes. the Denver Broncos. Yes. I remember that one being also very frustrating to watch. Yep. And that was also a blowout where Peyton Manning and the uh, Denver Broncos couldn't score a touchdown. Yeah. So the one football game I watched a year re- reinforced to me why I don't watch football anymore. <laughs> Turns out. Right. But as a, as a viewer <laughs> every week of every game, <sighs> you always know that this is a possibility that could happen. Yeah. Just, just depressing. Just depressing all around. It's um, <laughs> fair. That's fair. Don't I cajole them. <laughs> I wouldn't want to talk about it either if I wasn't on a podcast. That's all I got. Commercials were pretty good this week, this year. Yeah, there were some good ones. Um, not really the purview of the sports corner, but yeah. Um, mm-hmm. We're all right. Yeah. Um, I Except think for that one, that one that erased Miranda, Miranda Lambert from everyone's memories. <laughs> the the dropped one. calls, the eight, the T-Mobile dropped mm-hmm. calls thing that yeah. they're doing with that and Gronk and Brady did not did. oh yeah I guess the last thing we should talk about with the with the Super Bowl is that yeah the grand return of the Gronk yes two, uh, touchdown, two Gronk touchdowns spikes, two Gronk spikes um, yeah I was hoping for a third so Gronk could get an uh, MVP trophy for himself but no but no you knew um, they were going to give it to Brady no matter what happened probably but um, Tom Brady speaking of Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski They have set yet another record today, actually, as the first um, quarterback and receiver duo to throw a pass over water. Okay. I don't know if you've seen this. No. But Tom Brady threw the Lombardi Trophy (laughs) over water to Gronk, (laughs) passing from one boat to another, because today was their boat parade party. Wow. Okay. That's weird. That's a weird thing. I mean, I'm just happy that he caught it and didn't like fall into the ocean. right. He just <laughs> lost forever. <laughs> Actually, that'd been really hilarious. <laughs> All right. So the Super Bowl happened. That's history now. Also history. The rest of the sports news. We move on to the newest members of the Pro Football Hall of Fame have been announced. Mm-hmm. They are <laughs> guard Alan Feneca of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Steel curtain oh, line. Yeah. Coach Tom Flores. Who was the first um uh, <laughs> well he won he okay, so he won a uh, Super Bowl as a player. He's one of two people to win as a the Super Bowl as a player, an assistant coach, and a head coach. And he's also the first minority head coach to win oh. a Super Bowl. Okay. Wide receiver Calvin Johnson. AKA Megatron. Yeah. Safety John Lynch. Uh, of the Cardinals, I believe. Quarterback. I don't know. I've never heard of this dude. Peyton Man Thing. Um, he did the Sony commercials <laughs> with his brother. Oh, more yeah. famous and two time Super Bowl right. um, yeah. winning yeah. quarterback of yeah, the Eli. New York yeah. Football Giants. Yes, yeah. Ellie yeah. Manning. Ellie. Ellie. Uh, no, Peyton Manning, obviously, the one oh, who. Of- Peyton's places on ESPN Plus. Yes, uh huh. Yes, this week. Him of his places. <laughs> uh yeah, no. Obviously, Peyton Manning uh, deserves this place. We knew first he would get, ba- get it. Uh, first ballot Hall of Famer, Peyton Manning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, contributor Bill Nunn, who was responsible for the Steelers dynasty in the seventies. Uh, wide receiver Drew Pearson. Uh, the first. Uh, wide receiver for the Dallas Cowboys to wear number 88 and originally set the wide receiving record. 
Uh-huh. And cornerback slash safety, Charles Woodson. Just some guy who hit really hard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was a beast on defense for Raiders and for the Packers. So good picks, you think? Good yep, solid all good round. picks, all good stuff. If Ooh. you want to shed some manly, manly man tears and watch other men shed <laughs> manly man tears, go on YouTube, search the uh, the NFL's YouTube page and just watch the video of all these players <laughs> officially getting the welcome into Canton, Ohio, and it'll make you cry. It's very <laughs> emotional because it has always been a very in-person ceremony to basically surprise the nominees and congratulate them into Canton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. It's very emotional. Definitely check it out. (laughs) Manly Man Tears here. Manly Man Tears. All right, let's move on to other sports here. Our next uh, takes us to baseball and up, everybody, new ball dropped. Hey, new ball dropped. Um, They've nerfed the baseball, everyone. Oh, did they nerf the baseball? It's been nerfed. Uh, okay, to be specific, Major League Baseball will have new baseballs that will fly one to two feet shorter when hit over 375 feet. In an effort to better center the ball, Rawlings has loosened the tension on the first three wool windings within the ball. Its research estimates the adjustment will bring the coefficient of restitution, the COR, down 0.1 or 0.01, sorry, to 0.02, and will also lessen the ball's weight by 2.8 grams without changing the size. So, um, so, sure. There was some research done that over the course of the past two, three years, or the past three years, that more home runs have been hit because they changed the ball design of the baseball uh-huh. by making it tighter, making it more packed, so it'll yeah. have more bounce coming off of right. it. Well... <laughs> they don't want that anymore <laughs> okay yeah oh wait so you're saying that there's this is rollback this is rollback yes. on a patch yes <laughs> <laughs> they're um, like oh the baseball so is too op the ball so they won't go, <laughs> so they won't fly farther however they said that it should not affect the pitchers uh pitching the ball mm-hmm. with the turn the speed velocity everything that it only should be affected when hit or bounced off anything. Yeah. So instead of instead of making all the fielders better, they decided to nerf the ball. And so now Mike Trout is I guess Mike Trout was too OP. And so they had to nerf his ball. Well not just Mike Trout, but it was all across <laughs> all leagues. No, I really I, there are joke, still okay. clubhouses <laughs> who will dense the balls with humidifiers. I think currently seven <laughs> of the clubs do that. Okay. So in order to curb home runs. Oh man. <laughs> Baseball's weird. Mm-hmm, especially since we just talked about the Hall of Fame. Yeah, it's okay, very, yeah. very weird. All righty. Let's move on. The Dallas Mavericks <coughs> have not and will not play the national anthem before any of their home games this season. Did they happen to say why? Well, we are currently seven games, or at least technically 13 with preseason home mm-hmm. games for the Dallas Mavericks into the season Mm -hmm. and this past week they officially allowed fans which is why this is now a story and not back when the season (laughs) began back when everybody's just watching on tv it's like oh i guess they skipped the anthem oh well (laughs) or oh i showed up late they must have done the anthem before i got up. right nope they just didn't do it uh this is at the (laughs) behest of mark cuban owner of Uh... the Dallas mavericks uh he spoke with Adam Silver to see if he could do it, and hmm. Adam Silver gave him the go-ahead, so they are not playing the national anthem. Okay, sure. Interesting. I wonder if any other teams will see this and try this as well, but I can't imagine they will. Well, there's a whole history of what's of why we played the national anthem mm-hmm. in front of sports games, which is a great read on wikipedia and a great tunnel if you want to join into that <laughs> if you need a wikipedia hole we got one for you <laughs> yep just just search for national anthem at sports sporting events <laughs> and enjoy yourself and possibly join the movement of getting it removed we'll see all right 
anything right. else in sports world before we move on to television yes news? speaking of national anthem and where you can hear a lot of it okay. being played and blared in the parking lot nascar daytona is this yes, weekend. yes nascar daytona or should i say stay tona as you should not be having a party anywhere <laughs> yeah. before daytona yeah my, uh, it's my one yeah, opportunity to talk about currently running right now yeah uh looks like william byron is in first place uh this is also the start of the next season for nascar yeah and if you want to get hyped up um if you're a fan it's exciting that's all it's exciting. <laughs> spoken like a true yeah. fan <laughs> Six straight days of racing. Um, yeah, if you want to get hyped up, go to YouTube and look up the Daytona USA theme song from the Sega Arcade game. <laughs> Trust me, it gets you. It gets you wired for that Daytona. Gets the hype going. Daytona. Anyways, in that case, let's move on into television news. Why don't we? Yes. Our thanks. first story takes us. To the universe of the CW. They're constantly announcing new shows. And one of the newest ones is a very peculiar, cho peculiar choice. We'll see why in a second. They've made a number of initial orders for their 2021 to 2022 season, including a pilot order for a live action adaptation of Cartoon Network's The Powerpuff Girls. Throw quotes around here because yeah. it's not what you think about Powerpuff Girls. Yeah, because the new series will see the superheroes as disillusioned 20-somethings who resent having lost their childhood to crime fighting. The project hails from Heather Renier from Sleepy Hollow and Diablo Cody, who you mentioned earlier, Juno, Young Adult, uh, that, what was the United States of Terra, her show on um, Showtime? Yes. Uh, who serves as writers and executive producers. So if that's not weird enough, there's more. CW has ordered three pilots and a reboot of the 4400 from the USA Network. Remember that show? Yeah. Is that the show where the thing was that they were blue? No, that was the, that was the <laughs> show where they disappeared and then all of a sudden all returned at the same time. I thought that was that other show. No, no, that's The Happening. Yes, One the other, concept is yeah. not new. No, they've done this so many uh, times. But the original uh, show starred uh, future Oscar winner Mahershala Ali. All oh, right. In one of his uh, first basically starring vehicles right. for TV. Right. The other two pilots on the CW are for the DC project Naomi from Ava DuVernay, which I don't even need to tell you what she's done. We talked about her so much on this podcast already. Me and your favorite and, Ava DuVernay. Yes. And an untitled religious dramedy from Claire Roth, Rothrock, that's a good name, and Ryan Weir, uh, who I guess both, worked on something called Basic Witch. Both of them worked on Basic Witch. I don't know what that uh, was. Where was that? They were writers on Basic Witch. Both of these are actually actors. Yeah, who but uh, pitched a show. Where did that air? What was that on? Internet. Okay, got it. Thank you <laughs> for that very specific answer. <laughs> Uh, Naomi, the first one, is based off the comic book of the same name, co-written by Brian Michael Bendis and David F. Walker, about a teen girl's journey from her small northwestern town to the heights of the multiverse. The Untitled Project is about two millennial nuns who start as strangers and become sisters in the Catholic Church. So CW keeps on CWing with weird-ass concepts for shows. Yes. Uh, also, <laughs> these are for all those 20-somethings and teenagers who wish they were 20 somethings yeah all right let's talk about more television which you collected in a collection of bits for us the bits the bits the bits I if you love bits we've been giving you week in a row so much bits lately yeah so many bits first up in the bits hey the thing we said that might happen last week happened jeopardy oh, alumni <laughs> we're so good at this we're really we're, so more people need to listen to us seriously go back to the last week's <laughs> podcast yes. and just skip to us talking about jeopardy and <laughs> dr oz <laughs> yeah literally we're good at this job it's not even a job we don't even get paid for this but we're good at it not yet but if you want to pay us <laughs> we have a patreon well, we don't right now, but we could in the future again. I have my hand out. <laughs> yes, you can place money in it. We have PayPal's. Just 
email us anyways email us at media boat podcast at yeah. gmail.com we should have a um media boat venmo <laughs> we do it is my phone number <laughs> <laughs> i would not give that away drop it right, right to my <laughs> yeah, don't no, list that internet. don't list your phone number in public trust me it's a bad idea all right Okay, to explain what we're talking about, Jeopardy alumni have spoken out against Dr. Oz being named for a future guest host of Jeopardy. As we mentioned last week, Dr. Oz, not a great track record. He's had some real awful stuff either said by him or on his show, recent as recent as stuff about the uh, coronavirus. And it's just, he's kind of a crock and a quack and not and a great person you want to see representing Jeopardy. He promotes pseudoscience. Not yeah. necessarily all of it is good advice. No. So fire beware, which is yeah. basically what everyone was saying and basically calling out, come on, Jeopardy, you can do better than this. He's not a real doctor, even though, yes, <laughs> he is a doctor. And he's a television personality. He's a doctor like Dr. Phil is a doctor. Let's be real. All right. Yeah, but like, I'm sure they have like Dr. Ritz, but that doesn't mean they're <laughs> doctors. Well, I mean, that's, I wouldn't go that far because that's kind of unfair. There's right, many kinds of doctors. We have Doctor Biden right. in the house. Yeah, there's all sorts of doctors. You, it's still a doctor if you have if you have a doctorate. Obviously, we're not saying that. Right. But what we are saying is Doctor Oz specifically is maybe not uh, somebody who represents the best of what that could say about somebody. And he has in the past, yes, advertised and advocated for things that are not good ideas. Right, especially when you have actual, when you have not want to say actual doctors, he's an actual doctor. When you have doctors <laughs> and medical journals, journals coming out speaking right. out against the stuff that he is promoting, yeah, might not be the best at no. what he does. Not who you want to get. All right, next up in the bits, Nick Cannon. Um, oh boy, he's had a rough couple of years, hasn't he? Uh, tested positive for COVID. So that means he will be replaced by Nisi Nash for the start of the fifth season of The Masked Singer in place as host. No word yet if he will come back to, as mm-hmm. the host. Yeah. I mean, I think it would be better for all of us if he didn't come back. <laughs> yeah. Fox was one of the ones, one holdouts with yes. his contract. Everybody else kind of dropped him from whatever he was doing. I believe he has returned to his podcast, though. Uh, but other than that, he kind of was, yeah, he was kind of dropped by all sorts of things except for the mass singer. Right. But just like us, he can host a podcast anywhere he wants as long yeah. as someone will host him. And just like us, not nobody has to listen to it. Like <laughs> Nobody does, in fact. All right. Hey, we get <laughs> listeners. Talking about Nick Cannon, not us. Yes, yes. Nick Cannon should Nick not Cannon. be listened to. Nick Cannon. Yeah, there we go. Uh, next up in the bits, Paramount Plus, uh, by the way, one has a release date, March 4th. Uh, that's not in the bits, but might as well report that. That, that right. is I mean, if you were watching the Super Bowl, it was basically yeah. every fifth commercial. Yeah, to varying degrees of, of funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But they've uh, announced that they are, they're teasing a iCarly revival, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago on the show, with cast photos on set featuring Miranda Cosgrove. So that more or less confirms that the titular iCarly will come back for the reboot. Well, at least for the first episode. Yeah. Because like we saw with set cameo. photos for the Fuller House reboot when that happened. Right. Obviously, yes. it didn't star everyone. But Miranda Cosgrove is involved in some capacity. Yes. So there you go. Or at least in the in universe in some capacity. Yeah. Next up in the Fox News universe, they've canceled Lou Dobbs tonight following a $2.7 billion defamation suit against Fox News and three of its hosts. Um, if you haven't been following the Lou Dobbs mess, yeah, he's been kind of, well, yeah, there's a whole lot going on with him. <laughs> right, that lawsuit is in direct, um, directly related to the the defamation of voting machines, right. and how they're saying that votes shouldn't count, uh, yeah. saying that the votes machines got it wrong. I, uh, this isn't Dominion. That's a separate lawsuit. This is a different <laughs> right uh, vote vote counting system. Which you know, when you start blaming everyone, you're kind of ruining the reputation on news and yeah. not labeling yourself as an entertainment uh yeah category oh, while we're on the subject of fox news this is not really news but just wanted to 
mention it here. I did see that apparently Fox News is going to double down even more so than they have already on personality driven programming and move even further away from news coverage in order to compete with the um, currently upstart uh, Newsmax, which is kind of taking a lot of its audience away. So right. Newsmax and OAN. Yeah, so uh, bad news all around because we don't need more of these things popping up, but here we are. No, we just need them to all eat each other. Yeah. Next up in the bits, Disney Plus is going to be streaming the 1997 ABC musical TV movie adaptation of Cinderella, a.k.a. the one that starred Brandy, Wendy Houston, and Whoopi Goldberg. Hey, I actually like that one, girl. Yeah, no, I remember liking this a lot as a kid. It was one of our household favorites. It was probably our generation's introduction to the Rodgers and Hammerstein's version of Cinderella. Mm -hmm. um, so it's uh, cool that they're bringing this back for all us old ass millennials to enjoy <laughs> yep also bringing all this old ass millennial stuff to enjoy later this month uh the muppets all right. original episodes from the muppet show i mean that's not that's not really for millennials that's for boomers let's be real uh but <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's their nostalgia not ours i mean we may have grown up watching repeats but hey if it's not new to you no no, if they really wanted to pander to the millennials, they would bring back Muppets Tonight, which was the late 90s Muppets revival that they did for ABC, which uh, has one of my all time favorite um, YouTube or videos that I that's now on YouTube for everybody to see, which was Kermit doing an impersonation of David Byrne in the Talking Heads um, video. That is very specific. Yeah, if you look up kermit talking heads you'll probably found it he does um a once in a lifetime i was blanking on the name of the song and it's the my favorite youtube video <laughs> oh next to collective soul cat which is another one of my favorites and, and next to deli e t p e t s yes well wet pet san pablo but yeah uh, i recommend everybody who's listening to this podcast if you have not seen kermit do once in a lifetime it is a wonderful wonderful thing <laughs> so yeah no if they really wanted to get the millennials bring back muppets tonight on disney plus i'm sure it's in their vault somewhere it's in their vault somewhere they're not doing anything with it all righty uh lastly in the bits here if you're a discovery plus owner and haven't already um dug into the back catalog of good eats well good news good eats new episodes uh which we had already reported that were coming at some point are heading exclusively to Discovery Plus. So they will not be on YouTube, which I think the previous iteration was of the newer episodes, uh, newer content related to the Good Eats brand. Unfortunate that Alton Brown has come out as kind of a conservative, conservative dude, but you know, Good Eats was still a fun show that I enjoyed watching when I was younger. And um, yeah, I'm still still happy to see it around. Yeah, uh, Alton Brown still hosting. Um, yeah. 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 So there you go. Discovery there Plus, another thing to watch on there. And uh, that's it for the television bits. We so, watched some stuff. We watched, we watched some watched stuff. Quite stuff. Let's, uh, let's start talk with about the it. Super Bowl halftime show since we already kind of talked about that. At least talked yeah. about the Super Bowl. Uh, but yes, um, as we alluded to heavily last week yes. in our episode, The weekend was... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen... The weekend. <laughs> I was so mad, by the, the way. So I had planned the whole time to tweet, to retweet that Twitter account as soon as he was about to perform. Yes. 23 seconds after I did, that account did the same joke and <laughs> tweeted that at the same time. And I did. I was so mad. I was like, no, I was so supposed mad. to. You my had idea. the idea. Yeah. It was right there. So, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, the weekend. However, weekend. Daniel Craig was not there to introduce him, unfortunately. No. Um, so what do you but think about... it was about... nice of Pepsi to give a lot of airtime to Coke. <laughs> Every, yes, I saw three different variations on that joke. One of my favorites, favorites was, yeah, like, like, really? Like, it's funny that he says Pepsi branding everywhere. I always thought the weekend is more of a Coke guy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so what, how did you think overall about the weekend's uh, performance? Here. So, because they didn't have to be on the field, <laughs> he used that to his advantage. 
Yeah. He partied right next to the giant ship. <laughs> uh, the giant pirate ship had his own basically section all set up, socially distanced and everything. Yeah, Everyone was wearing masks. It was really cool to see. Um, he played the hits. He, he actually played so much of the hits that he played songs straight off his latest album, The yeah. Highlights. Right. Well, that's because The Highlights is, turns out, like we talked about last week, a greatest hits record. We weren't sure about it, but we I checked it out. And yes, that's a, exactly what it is. Hey, I don't care. He played the hits. He, <laughs> he played the hits. Or, turns he, out. you know, he, he played his latest album because it was a concert of his and you always play the latest album uh, when you go to a concert. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I liked it. It had some good AR stuff in the beginning yeah. to open it up because we can do that now. Yeah. Um, it got a good meme out of it. Let's just talk about that, can we? <laughs> yeah. The, being we, lost in the golden room. <laughs> yeah, being lost in the freaking maze. My favorite that I saw of that was some dude had turned it into... You know the the maze um, Windows ninety five screensaver. Yes. Someone did it where it starts with the weekend and then it turns into that screensaver. <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I thought it was a really good performance. I thought it was unique in the way that he kind of played around with where he was, like the freedom that they allowed him to kind of do whatever they wanted. Me meant he wasn't just you know stuck on a stage like a lot of these performances are. Well, that's the thing, though, is that because of COVID and social distancing, mm. you didn't, that's, you couldn't, not mm -hmm. you didn't have to, but you couldn't have field fans on the field right. for storming and per, while you're storming the uh, area while you're performing. So it, it made for a very interesting visual performance because there was constantly something new going on as he went through his catalog, mm -hmm. uh, kind of ending in that, like, climax where every all well, like the dancers and him are all in the field and they kind of all collapse and he's the last one standing it made for a lot of really striking moments and kept you interested the whole time i think the last time i really enjoyed a, a halftime show like this was the lady gaga one a few years ago uh where it was just like clearly he had a very specific vision and he was able to execute it in the way that he wanted to right and i think that's one thing that he did right is that it was visually striking. It is something that is a memorable performance. You don't get a lot of those from Super Bowl halftime shows typically yeah. in the past, especially in that post Janet Jackson yes. um, legacy acts that they were doing. You didn't get a whole lot of those striking visuals aside from Prince and the massive right. white sheet. Right. I mean, nothing's ever gonna be as good as the Prince one was. So it's really a moot point to even try to compare. Yeah. Um, but. <laughs> In fact, nothing compares. Um, but anyway. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Uh, so yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. The weekend is a kind of a strange choice for a halftime show. I think even after I've seen it, it's still kind of a weird choice. Like they go with the weekend instead of Drake. Really? Well, um, which makes yeah. me wonder if the Drake wanted too much, if the Drake. The Drake. Combined the two of them just now. If Drake wanted too much money or something is my Well, he wanted thought. the State Farm money. Apparently, he was fine doing a State Farm commercial. Oh, God. Anyway, uh, but yeah, I thought the weekend was did good for what he, like, for what he has. They're not necessarily anthemic songs. Um, so. No, but he is a flashy performer. And yes. I really like that. Yeah. So it was fun. It was fun. Yeah. It was fun. It still had that, like, weekend edge to it. Just enough. Maybe a PG version of it, as opposed to what he usually gives us. I did watch the performance again on YouTube to see if it was just in the moment hype or if it yeah. was as good as I thought. And yeah, it holds up yeah. uh, two days later. It's fun. Yeah. All righty. Well, what else do we want to talk about then? What else did we watch this week? Uh, so I alluded to both of my shows that I talked about. Okay. And you alluded to the one show you talked about. <laughs> yes. Pick one. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll get mine out of the way first here. Okay. So... So if you've been you, paying attention we to talked the about, internet. And we talked about Palmer and yeah. Justin Timberlake. Well, so, yeah, his counterpart. The reason, reason why we brought that up was because, and, and well, I guess, to be fair, here at the Media Boat Podcast, we have been following the story. The story behind this new uh, docu-episode 
on FX, an episode of their New York Times Presents series um, called Framing Britney Spears. So this deals directly with the conservatorship that Britney Spears has been involved with um, that we've reported about on this very podcast in Music News. We've reported about that so much, it's become a recurring topic on the Media <laughs> podcast. Yes. So if you're not aware, uh, the basic real s- small version of this story is uh, Britney Spears, after her kind of um, uh, mental health um, issues that started po- popping up in the late 2000s, around 2007 to 2008, um, her father filed for a conservatorship, which basically is this thing typically reserved for elderly people which is, hey, it has been decided by family that this person is not in a mental state to either handle their own day-to-day life and or, and slash or, and this is important to the story, their estate, their money. Um, And so a conservatorship puts a person or or an entity, depending, in charge of one or both of those things. So the person basically has to go through this conservatorship to do things with their career, with their life, et cetera, with their money, et cetera. So her father basically was like, well, I don't think she is responsible. She should be responsible for her money to make professional decisions. Uh, so I'm basically locking that down and I'm going to be the, the person in charge of those things. And we should point out for the most part, conservatorships are meant for elderly people, That's people who have yeah. Alzheimer's who, who right. don't want to, who the family deems don't want them to be scanned out of their money. So it seems like um, her father was concerned about the financial part more so than the the personal part, um, but ultimately wanted to control basically all of those decisions that she would make day to day because of his feelings about where her mental state was. So. Over the years though, what has been revealed kind of slowly over time is that uh, Brittany seems to have, you know, the cognitive ability to live her life like a normal person. She seems to be making, uh, at least being part of savvy business decisions. Her Vegas show, her Vegas um, residency was incredibly popular Mm -hmm. and uh, made so much money. It became one of the most successful shows in Vegas. Which we talked about here. It was shut down unceremoniously, though, with her citing reasons for her, like her father's health as a reason for doing so, which brings into question how much control Brittany even had over that entire situation in Vegas. So things over time has kind of popped up, suggesting that Brittany is not uh, indeed happy with this conservatorship. She is now, in the last couple years, gone on the record, in fact, saying that she does not want her father in charge of it and wishes that a different entity would be, or alternatively, there not to be a conservatorship at all. And so the New York Times uh, did a lot of reporting around this, and this episode on FX is basically a really neat and tidy recap of everything that's happened so far. It's a very well-produced thing that basically breaks it down. So if you're just coming into this now, what the history of this was, why she's in it, what the reality of it is now during the conservatorship, where she's at like going forward and how that might actually affect, like how ongoing litigation around the conservatorship might change going forward. We reported recently kind of the more recent um, changes, which was she tried to get her father off of it. The court basically denied the request and has kept the father on, though a bank has added itself to the conservatorship for the estate portion. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it kind of answers a lot of questions that you might have about like, what does this mean? Who was involved? Like, what were the players involved in this happening in the first place? So it does that part really well. But then the other thing that it does, not too dissimilarly from the uh, Taylor Swift documentary from last year, Miss Americana, it also gives you a peek into this, the effect that mass, masses of people turning a back on a celebrity, what effect that has on the celebrity that they've turned against. Brittany was in a situation in that time where she was under a lot of mental stress. Um, and so what society kind of looked at as a funny joke about her falling apart, about her shaving her head, about her 
you know, having meant like freakouts against the paparazzi at the time was treated as a joke. Like the, uh, the documentary actually does a good job of kind of rounding up really cringy late night bits from that era of like Jay Leno making really bad, like bad taste jokes about it, about um, an episode of Family Feud where there was a bunch of punchlines about Britney's mental health. And to, to be fair, you could throw all of Jay Leno's jokes into a barrel <laughs> and you could easily shoot one that was offensive. Yeah, no, that's fair. But so, yeah, and so it's it's this interesting time capsule where, and you could probably rewind the tape on all of us, and we were probably all guilty of this. It was very easy to make, well, except for Leave Britney Alone guy, which has been vindicated like times 10 over the years, wherever mm -hmm. that guy is, I hope he's doing okay. Yeah. Um, well, because this happened when we were in high school. Yes. And I remember them using right. the shaped photo as a promotion mm -hmm. to get into the yearbook club. Yes, it was a very easy kind of thing to pile on. But our understanding about mental health was very different even in 2008 than it is now. I think looking back, if this had happened now, we would, and, and uh, a celebrity of Britney's stature had been, for example, something that actually happened with her, admitted to a hospital under 5150, we would retreat, we would treat it with Respect. Extreme we would caution. treat it with Respect. understanding. We would understand what was going on more than we did back then when, when we could see it as an easily tidy up as a nice like, oh, Brittany got, gone crazy joke. And so it's a really interesting look back to where just how primitive we were with our understanding as a society about these machinations and about what it meant to be a celebrity of this stature. Ultimately, also... it comes down to like the, like the situation she was in, not only was she constantly having harassment by paparazzi, but there's the additional layer of her, her custody of her children. There was a back and forth battle with Kevin Federline at this time, who she had divorced and they had both filed for custody of the children and it kind of went back and forth in courts from there on. And that was also a mental toll on her. So. You can't even see your kids. There's a possibility of uh, postpartum depression. Also, she's getting like, like uh, diagnosed with um, depression and anxiety for the first time in her life around this time. All this is happening and all we as a society are doing are just making fun of her. So I can't blame her for what happened after that. Right, I mean, it was in the height of the paparazzi of mm -hmm. scandal right. of cameras literally following her around everywhere she went. So yeah, and you do actually get some interesting perspectives from that point of view as well. You get, uh, in this documentary, you get um, a couple of people who are involved in US Weekly publication. You get a photographer. In fact, the photographer who took a, like a lot of the famous pictures of uh, Brittany with her bald head. Um, so you get interesting points of view and interesting perspectives from that era now and what they, like looking back, that they even feel guilty about what kind of the pain that they put this person through. Um, ultimately though, it ends on kind of a hopeful note. Um, it does kind of leave the, the, the path open for there to be further litigation. This is not by any means done. Brittany continues to fight against this and it does seem to be clearer every day that she wants out of it whatever way, or at least out of her father's purview as fast as possible. So I would say if you're interested in the story that that's kind of been ongoing about Britney at all, or if you're interested in kind of celebrity culture and it's kind of negative effects, kind of like I was talking about with the Taylor Swift stuff, this is another version of that. Just the horror that somebody, especially a woman um, who is in the world, like the world's watching eye has to deal with and how bad it was then and how it's still really bad now. So. Um, do note that much like a conservatorship, Brittany does not speak on her behalf during this thing. <laughs> yeah. No, they could not get, they tried to get interviews with Brittany and her entire family, which includes both of her parents, her sister, Jamie Lynn, and her brother, Brian. None you, of them apparently responded to You mean her the, parents, Jamie? And Lynn and her yes, sister, Jamie, Jamie Lynn, Lynn. And Jamie Lynn. Yes. <laughs> it's super messed up when you think about it that way. Uh, but yeah. Um, so yeah, none of them commented on this. And they make it a point to say that at the end of this thing. Uh, like, yeah, 
nothing. So yeah, it's an interesting thing. It's fascinating. And uh, yeah, also uh, Justin Timberlake, man, screw that guy. <laughs> Even though we Crumbia just praised River. his acting. <laughs> yeah, we praised his acting earlier, but yeah, this some of the stuff that they, uh, the recordings they have of him from this era talking of, like shit about Britney is just really, really hard to look back on now. Yes, um, I would like an updated version of him looking at this stuff and be like, oh man, I said that. Just like, oh, I really, I really hope cringy. that he says something. But the fact that he's still been silent about this, even though this has kind of been rumbling for the last week, uh, makes me I'm think not that sure. he's because not gonna... this is on FX and I didn't even know about it until I saw that you put it in the notes. Like, what oh. is this thing? Maybe much like with other FX documents like Roe v. Wade or whatever it was, I am Wade, I am Roe, whatever the yeah. one we talked about last year, right? Kind of just happens and then goes away, just so some direct because it is a doc on FX. We also have very different Twitter circles where this has been the only thing that people I follow want to talk right. about this week. So, <laughs> so I don't know. It depends on where you're at in the internet, but yeah, I recommend it. It's a really good piece of documentary filmmaking, I think, uh, and a fascinating portrayal of celebrity um, from that era in that in the late '90s to uh, late the 2000s. Okay. Anyway, what else did you watch this week? Uh, well, if you want to keep on joining in the uh, Justin Timberlake hate train, <laughs> but still want to keep Apple Plus, <laughs> Apple uh -huh. TV Plus. I got a show that might be for you. Um, it's based off the Charles Schultz cartoons, mm -hmm. um, the Peanuts. Yes. But it's not necessarily about the Peanuts gang. Or is it? Wait, are you telling me that Snoopy has come down from space? Yes, it's no longer Snoopy in space. Yeah, I, was underst I understood he was in space for a while. So what's brought him back to, to Earth? His ego. <laughs> <laughs> okay so the snoopy show uh what is the this snoopy show uh the first episode of the snoopy show it, the snoopy show is a retelling origin story oh. of snoopy putting out a memoir an exaggerated <laughs> memoir as snoopy does <laughs> uh -huh. typing on his typewriter and so charlie brown has to correct the memoir they say no that's not how that happened this is exactly what happened this is how I found Snoopy. This is how I changed him to be my loyal best friend dog. This is how his doghouse got built. This is how he met Woodstock. First episode is just a plain old or origin story. The other episodes involve the Peanuts gang, hmm. but through Snoopy's perspective or more mm -hmm. centered around Snoopy. So okay. you don't so Snoopy is involved in every episode. Each episode contains about two or three different shorts inside each one for a 30 minute in total cartoon. And it's basically the Peanuts gang. It's the Peanuts show. It's just not labeled the Peanuts because <laughs> people mainly know the Peanuts as Snoopy. That's the Snoopy show. Which right. I can make, make sense of why they call it the Snoopy show. It's actually kind of smart branding when you think about it, because he is the mascot, more or less, yes. of that franchise. Also, even when he even when he was alive, Charles Schultz was on the record to say that he did not like the fact that the name was Peanuts. And that may be partly why they decided to go with this animation instead of returning to Blue Sky Studios, as we talked about earlier, with the Peanuts movie that they did. Right. So this is kind of a complete like rebranding, but at least they're putting like the namesake Snoopy up front in this, something that will attract people to immediately know that Snoopy, the Snoopy show, kind of like Snoopy in space, easily recognizable. And Snoopy is kind of at the forefront here with everything. Does it play better that way? Maybe because you don't have to pay the child actors that much because <laughs> they're yeah. not appearing as much. Yeah, that's fair. But for the most part, it's really fun. It's kind of nostalgic ish and hits that right kind of tone of your inner child and inner childhood um, nostalgia while watching this. Like, oh, that was nice. That was sweet. I liked that. 
So definitely check out uh, the Snoopy show. It hits the child, inner child just right and might inspire even more children to watch and be beloved of Snoopy. So expect this to be good for a good thing for Apple TV+. Plus. Yeah, no. Um, I feel like there's been a, a lack of Peanuts content since that movie. And I think that it's still a very popular like bunch of characters that people really love. So I think it's really smart for them to take advantage of that they have the rights to the characters at this moment on Apple. Yep, uh, the animation does look good. I mean, it is an updated version of the classic hand-drawn animation in which it's cl very clean looking, but it still has that right, just rough around the edges feel to where it does reminisce of hand-drawn, even though it's clearly not. It's too clean to not be hand-drawn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's good. That sounds that sounds quality. Mm -hmm. Now that I got yeah. the good thing out of the way. Oh, okay. We're ready to to take a take a crap on something. I like it. Uh okay. So Disney Channel original movie used to mean something. <laughs> Did it though? Did it, did it really? Because I feel like it's always been bad and we just kind of told ourselves that it was good. Motocross is a good movie. <laughs> Brink. Okay, it's one. Brink is a good movie. No, it is not. We watched that together. The last time I saw Brink, we watched that together in the same room. It is not a good movie. <laughs> oh no, I've watched it since. And if Brink <laughs> did nothing, everything would have been fine. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? It's See, also- It mean nothing in that movie. <laughs> Yeah, see, also when I watched Smart House and found out the Smart House is still bad. <laughs> anyway, okay. Anyways, okay, so. It, yeah. Disney it, Channel original movie. Yeah, they were never good. We're here. <laughs> All right, but we're, okay, so we're talking about the latest one that was released on Disney Plus. Yeah. All these streaming stuff, because that's all we watch now, exclusively. Yes. No, I, yeah, it's just, we shouldn't have to tell you. There's no reason to watch anything on network television anymore. <laughs> Everything's on streaming. Uh, this is titled Upside Down Magic. Yes. So imagine Harry Potter. Okay. Where you you have the gift of magic and you go to this magical school where <laughs> there are houses set up depending on your type of magic. Uh -huh. Whether it's shooting fire. Yeah. Transforming forming into animals. I'm having deja vu. It's like I just talked about this when I talked about Fate the Wink Saga. Yes. Um, yeah. I'll, we also just talked about it with <laughs> The Witches too. Um, Earwick and the Witch. Yeah. Um, let's see. Well, there's uh, talking to animals. There's floating objects to you. And there's, oh, flying. That's mm -hmm. the fifth one. So there's okay. five different magical houses that you get put into based on whatever magical ability you have. Sure. You only get one magical ability, but it's a school. So, hey, hey. diversity for all. <laughs> Unless your magic doesn't work right, in which they call upside down magic. Oh, I get it. Okay. So, if your magic doesn't work right, what do they do? <laughs> There's got to be a, a better way. Right. You're at a school. Isn't the school supposed to teach you your magic and how to use think? it right? Isn't it? Isn't that the purpose of school? To learn how to do magic correctly? Not here. What they do at this school is if you are deemed to have upside down magic, they basically lock you away <laughs> with other people who don't know how to do magic correctly, the other <laughs> upside down magic people. And <laughs> The, according to the old adage, if you don't use it, you lose it. They are told to not practice magic, not learn magic, and basically forget that magic ever exists in order for them to be re-released back into society where they will become normal people because they don't have magic. Mm -hmm. But clearly they do have magic, right? Shouldn't they be practicing that and getting good at it? Yeah, you'd think. No, they can, they can, they literally, the principal headmaster comes down to them and says, you are remedial. We cannot teach you. Hmm. You must not learn how to do magic. This because, sounds like a metaphor. Mm, doesn't it? Yes. Hmm. 
Hmm. Makes you uh, think. Yeah, it did make me think like, oh, they're going <laughs> this way, aren't they? Huh. This is okay. kind of deep and dark. And why is this school in process if this is how they treat but students? I'm guessing, though, that they do not pull this off. Like, <laughs> Oh, no, they do. They purposely keep them away. Uh-huh. There no, is... no, I mean, quality of the show wise. It's like an interesting concept, but they do not pull it off. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. Even the principal is meant to come off as a pompous doofus because when the big uh, so the reason that they can't they're not supposed to practice magic is because it's supposedly an easy way for the darkness of course to overtake them yes and threaten their way of life in society are you telling me in the in the voice of that guy from the wink saga it's all connected it's all connected <laughs> So um, the darkness eventually takes over not our main character, but our main character's best friend, okay. a normal normal magic person, uh-huh. and threatens Founder's Day by dark using dark magic. Mm-hmm. Really unclear what the goal is of the dark magic. <laughs> to be dark. Basically just wants to... Get rid corrupt. Of other corrupt other people's magic and become stronger mm-hmm. magic or yeah. something really yeah. generically dark person. It's like you know, it's like the coronavirus. It needs it's, to it's create new evil. variants. <laughs> yeah, it's evil one, and it creates new variants to get even more evil. Basically, it doesn't need a reason. It's black and cloudy and chaos <laughs> magic. Yeah. Uh, but the normal people who practice regular magic can't defeat them so he requires the upside down magic group to come together and defeat the darkness Mm -hmm. it's really weird even though the headmaster is there and you know unlike Dumbledore who's like a clear master of magical forces (laughs) this person is not (laughs) (laughs) I know Dumbledore they are no Dumbledore (laughs) I, I've seen magical schools before. This is not a magical school. No magical this school. This is clearly set up to bully one another. <laughs> so so yeah. this sucks, is there's, what you're saying? There's deep metaphors for uh-huh. exclusion and sure. princely and privatization and stuff. <laughs> but it sucks still. Yeah, okay. I regret watching it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't watch it. But it's there. It's there. Don't let your kids watch it either. Yeah. You may take some wrong lessons from it. Let's hope not. All right. Let's move on because we have got the rest of the show to get through. Oh, yeah, we do. And let's talk about cancellations and renewals. Big, uh, uh, not a big week, just a couple of ones, but one that's very near and dear to my heart to talk about. First Uh, up, though, on Sundance, The Split its third season will be its last. It's already in production, already shot. Um, finale will already be its last. All right. Then on HBO Max, they made a couple of big announcements today. First up, the uh, Search Party will get a fifth season on top of its existing HBO Max exclusive fourth season. Yes. And then... Uh, my my heart my heart grew a couple sizes today as I saw that the uh, date for the second season, <laughs> which had already been confirmed, of my favorite show of 2020, close enough, has been announced. It will be hitting at the end of February, uh, 25th, I believe. Yeah, end of February. And then it's also just- announced. You don't have this here, but I saw via Twitter. Uh, creator JG Quintel on tw- Twitter uh, also confirmed that it has been. Um, Order a third season has been ordered, so that means it will be a three season show at least. So hey, more more close enough. Another three season show, Infinity mm-hmm. Train, which has yes. been trying to get people to go yes. back and watch it and generate a. Uh, on I guess it. you could say on the bubble because that is not here today in today's right. renewals. So we'll see. Yes. But yes, uh, they released a new trailer for, I guess season two, for close enough. Yes, yes, and it looks amazing. It seems like everything I liked about the first season, they're just going to go for it again the second season. I'm very, very excited. More of the good stuff. Yeah. 
All right, now for some of the not so good stuff, we do have a few deaths to talk about here. Uh, if I can get the right emoticon, there we go. First up, Robert A. Altman. No, not that Robert Altman. The co-founder and CEO of Zenimax Media. He was 74. So I saw some of the Bethesda uh, worker, uh, some Bethesda employees on Twitter uh, specifically pointing out this one out. Next up, Christopher Plummer. Yes, that Christopher Plummer, age 91. Actor, was in The Sound of Music, Beginners, All the Money in the World, et cetera, et cetera. Won an Oscar back in 2012. So yeah. I think that was for Beginners, uh, the Oscar. You're right. I think so. Uh, Yeah, just a legend of stage and screen. Uh, Of course, most people remember him in The Sound of Music, but has plenty of other roles after that. Unless you're a millennial, then you remember him for replacing Kevin Spacey. Yes, that too. (laughs) That's more recent, yeah. Next up, Pedro Gomez, age 58, a sports journalist, worked for the Mercury News, the Arizona Republic, and ESPN. I believe he was one of their major MLB contributors. That makes sense. Then we have Ralph Backstrom, age 83, hockey player, played for the Montreal Canadiens, the Los Angeles Kings, and was a six times Stanley Cup champion. Wow. Yes, um, Tom Brady stepped right in front of him with seven championships, yeah. but still, six still. championships is a lot. That's a dynasty right there. Nothing to sneeze at, for sure. <laughs> a uh, Next up, Mary Wilson, age 76, a Hall of Fame singer and a member of the Supremes, credited, I believe, as a co-founder of the Supremes alongside... Um, Diana blanking. Ross. Diana Ross, thank you. <laughs> I don't know why I couldn't think of Diana Ross. Uh, um, this does mean that Diana Ross is the last, the last Supreme survivor of the Supremes. Okay. And then uh, lastly in deaths, we have Marty Schottenheimer, age 77. That name sounds familiar. You must know football because he was a player for the Buffalo Bills, coach for the Cleveland Browns and the Kansas City Chiefs. The San Diego eighth, uh, Chargers yeah. as well. Eighth in all-time wins at 205 and seventh in regular season wins at 200. He has the most wins of an NFL coach to not win a championship. He is the only eligible NFL coach with at least 200 regular season wins who has not been inducted to the Pro Pro Football Hall of Fame, although I would imagine that this gets amended next year. A posthumous one, probably. Um, He does have his son currently a coach in the league as well. Uh, But yeah, Schottenheimer is a really powerful name especially yeah. growing up in football in the 90s oh yeah no i heard that a lot growing up for sure yeah uh but yeah um out of his entire coaching career he's only had two seasons with a losing record wow that's impressive um his overall record for regular season is a 600 win winning percentage 600 mm-hmm. plus winning percentage however he's doesn't do so good in the playoffs with only a Got it. 200 winning percentage and is typically knocked out in the first or second round, which is kind of why he hasn't been in the Hall of Fame. Right, right. Because if he would have won a ring, he's easily in. Yeah. It's, it's a tough call. I think, yes, posthumously, he probably does get in. Yeah. For the legacy reason. I mean, 205 wins is a lot. Being eighth all time yeah. in wins and not being in there, you're kind of looking at some like Pete Rose numbers there. Right, right. This is a snub in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, that's a sad one. But yep, uh, those are your deaths for this week. Let's move on to the music section where I toss this over to you for the Billboard charts. And we always start Billboard or music with the Billboard. I'm going to start the Billboard with the Hot 100. Yep. And still, your hottest single in the <laughs> land is Driver's License by Olivia Rodrigo. She's been driving around town looking yep. for the boy she loves, saying, <laughs> screw you. <laughs> That's a different song. But That's sure. a different song. <laughs> That's a different song about getting your driver's license and driving around town. <laughs> yeah. Screaming at boys from afar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and number two. Mood by 24 Tilden featuring Ian Dior. At number three, Blinding Lights by Super Bowl halftime show performer The Weeknd. I guess former Super Bowl halftime show yeah. performer The Weeknd. 
because that yeah. passed. Yeah, that happened. Yeah, that happened last weekend. <laughs> At number four, three four plus three five, featuring Ariana Grande, not the remix. <laughs> yeah. And rounding out your top five, Levitating by Dua Lipa, featuring the baby. And if that, that sounded familiar. That's because that's exactly the same as last week. No changes in the Hot 100 this year uh, for the top five this week. Well, as for your albums chart, your Blue Board 200, I guess no one got the memo because Dangerous, colon, the double album by Morgan yeah. Wallen is still number one. There is no stopping the streaming machine. Once there's momentum, it just keeps going. People are still streaming uh, Morgan Wallen. In fact, it seems like there was an internet uh, from some maybe internet ne'er do wells. There was a push to actually have more streams after the controversy, as you could probably imagine. And so, yeah, Morgan Wallen has uh, only succeeded in this case, unfortunately. Well, for now, because yeah. as we pointed out, there were a couple albums that were released last week right. that won't hit until the following week. I would imagine that you see a different top five next week. Yep. Uh, number two, The Voice by Lil Durk. And number three, Shoot for the Stars, Aim for the Moon by Pop Smoke. At four, After Hours by the aforementioned The Weeknd. Getting a Super Bowl bump. And rounding out your top five, coming out, wow, out of nowhere, Legends yeah. Never Die by Juice <laughs> World. Yeah, not sure what that bump is about, but yes, uh, Juice World shot back up into the top five out of nowhere. I mean, Legends Never Die, the title says it in itself. Uh, sure, yes, you All can right. say that. If you didn't like any of those albums, we have new releases. We do. First up, New Fragility by Clap Your Hands, Say Yeah. Yeah, I did it. You did it. You have summoned them. <laughs> Wait, no, you have to do that three times in a row in order to summon them. Yeah, I yeah. think I'm good. I don't think they're here. Right. We also have Glowing in the Dark by Django Django. Mm -hmm. Life Rolls On by Florida Georgia Line. <laughs> yes, that FGL. Yeah, they're around. And lastly, Death by Rock and Roll by The Pretty Reckless. Yeah, they're still around too. Which is a pretty reckless way to die. Yeah. <laughs> ah. ah. All, All right, right. Let's get into some music news, shall we? And oh, we shall. if you thought we were done talking about Hall of Famers, we're not. Uh, we're not. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has announced 16 nominees. Okay, nominees. Yes. For its 2021 class of inductees. Yes. Offering some satisfaction for at last for fans who have long lobbied to see the Go-Go's and mm -hmm. Iron Maiden get on the ballot. While Foo Fighters and Jay-Z made it into contention in their very first year of eligibility. In fact, Jay-Z and Foo Fighters both released their debut albums all the way back in 1996. Yeah. Landing them just in the eligibility zone that requires nominees to have a catalog dating back at least 25 years. Yep. Nominees making their first appearance on the ballot, despite being previously eligible, include Fela Kuti and Dion Warwick. Mm -hmm. In addition, Twitter's to, favorite. In addition to Iron Maiden and the Go Go's, returning to contention after having been previously nominated, mm -hmm. include Mary J. Blige. Kate Bush, Devo, Shaka Khan, Carol King, LL Cool J, Rage Against the Machine, Todd Rudgreen, and Tina Turner. I feel like a few of these may have already been in, or at least uh, should have been in. Yeah, exactly. That's why they're still on the nominations list because they're not in yet. But um, but yeah, uh, solid choices here. Um, I'm yeah, I'm not sure who gets in at this point. Their their choices have been pretty wild the last few years, but still good. So I'm not really sure what direction they're going to go in this this year. I if mean, I was the people who were previously nominated, yeah, Tina Turner, Rage mm -hmm. Against the Machine, and Carol King should be in. Yeah, if I was picking, I'd probably go yeah, Tina Turner, Carol King, uh, the Go Go's, 
Mary J. Blige, Devo, and maybe Jay-Z. I'm not sure about the Foo Fighters. Also, Dave Grohl is already in the Hall of Fame as a member of Nirvana. Yes. So. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, the Foo Fighters did put out a new album last week. That's true. And we'll talk about that later. <laughs> So we'll see. I and mean, Jay-Z we'll see. also we'll put out new stuff as well, constantly. Actually, he's been more of a producer. Yeah, Jay-Z, yeah. He doesn't show up as much anymore, um, but he's definitely in the background of a lot of things. I mean, he doesn't he produce a lot of Beyonce stuff? Oh, well, yeah. He has, I'm sure, a lot of oversight on that, too. Right. So he's still around. He's still in the game. Yeah, he's still around. Still putting out new stuff. But yeah, uh, interesting to see where they go for actual inductees yeah we'll see but don't, uh, you don't have it down do no one will know i don't know uh, it wasn't in the story but um soon okay soon coming soon yes coming soon also or coming soon summer. the next <laughs> the next story yes also coming soon as we previously mentioned and alluded to the academy awards uh released their shortlist which included original songs mm -hmm. uh well both music categories actually um yeah. for original song and um, and score. score but we're mostly talking about song here because that's where you get popular artists involved it's where also you get the lyrics yes <laughs> that too helps yes and while there were a few surprises among the 375 member music branches 15 choices for best original score there is a remarkable shift in the original song category Mm -hmm. nearly half of the 15 songs on the list that emerged from narrative films or documentaries whose cast or subjects were predominantly black. Mm -hmm. Most of these songs had already been tagged as leading contenders, even though it was hardly a certainty they'd make the shortlist. Among them, media vote favorite Janelle mm -hmm. Monet's turntables mm -hmm. from the voter suppression doc All In, colon, the fight for democracy. Mary J. Blige's See What You've Done from the prison sterilization documentary, Belly of the Beast. John Legend's Never Break from the young actor doc, Giving Voice. Leslie Odom's Speak Now from One Night in Miami. Not to be uh, confused with Taylor Swift's Speak Now. Right, uh, One Night in Miami, directed by Regina King, which I think is available mm -hmm. on Prime Video now to watch. I think so. Uh, we also have Super Bowl performer, her, with Fight For You from the upcoming HBO Max, mm -hmm. Judas and the Black Messiah. Yep. And we have Celeste's Hear My Voice from the Netflix film, the trial of the Chicago Seven. All of them made it in yeah. to the nomination phase or the shortlist. Yeah. Joining them was the biggest surprise of this batch Layla Hathaway's song, Show Me Your Soul, from the Mr. Soul documentary about the PBS series <laughs> Soul. Not confused with Not the, confused Pixar with film, the Pixar film. The Pixar film. A minor surprise was the choice of Make It Work, sung by Anika Noni Rose and Forrest Whitaker in the holiday special Jingle Jangle, colon, A Christmas Journey, also on Netflix. Mm -hmm. yep. That's so, a lot of good songs. Yeah, a lot, yeah. lot of good contenders there, and it's cool for them to have such inclusivity in this category. I mean, also notable is that it's a year with a whole not a whole lot of disney competition um i mean soul did but that yeah, was, soul did not have an original have song one. so where yeah they don't have a real dog in this fight do they no i can't think of anything that was in a disney movie last year that would have been eligible <laughs> nope nope i'm wow. drawing a blank so yeah, it definitely leaves a path for all sorts of other options. Right. I mean, you don't have the, you also don't have like the easy one 
out yet. I mean, we will probably once the shortlist can gets dominated down to the actual nominations. Right. But I mean, let's see where the Golden Globes go first. And yeah, kind of that'll be a kind of the dry run for this for sure. Yep. All right. Let's talk about some music that we listened to. All right. Uh, we both listened to some stuff. I unfortunately only listened to one thing because I only had a limited time and mm-hmm. I recently remembered, oh yeah, I can get Apple Music now. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> completely off my mind, completely off my radar until literally today. It's like, oh yeah, I could do that. So I spent my 10 minutes listening to the hits <laughs> because that's pretty much all I had to listen to music. Yeah. I mean, I, I really want to get into the Foo Fighters. I really want to look forward to it. Unfortunately, I only had 10 minutes and I <laughs> went to the well that I knew would work. And that was the highlights by the weekend. And yeah, it's just that it's the hits. Yeah, it's the hits. It's the hits. If you get what you what it says you get on. Um, I will say, though, listening to that whole thing back to front makes me realize or front to back. I didn't really listen to it backwards. Yes. Although you could have because the interesting thing that they do here is that they front load a lot of his newer stuff. So if you're not as familiar with the last, uh, with After Hours, his most recent record, um, some of the biggest singles on that thing are in the first half of this. And so what it ends up feeling like is that he front loaded all the good stuff and kind of his older material, more like kind of mood setting, kind of vibier stuff is all in the back half. And so what it makes for a really weird feeling paced collection because I was really having a good time at the beginning and thinking like, oh man, I should have listened to this record. I actually enjoy a lot of this stuff. Maybe I like The weekend. And then by the time I was done, I was like, actually, I feel a little bit more mixed about The weekend, And I remember why I didn't like his original stuff. Well, it's a degradation. It's a breaking down of, the, of an artist. Yeah. It's here's where I am now. And let me take you through the journey of how I got here. Not yeah. here's where I started. Now here's where I end up. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's bad. I do understand why his earlier stuff was so critically acclaimed because it's very interestingly textured. He does a lot of really interesting things with the production, Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not my vibe. It's not my style. Like I don't need to listen to a dude talk about all the drugs he took and the girls that he met. Not Not my thing. However, I enjoy when it's less about that and more about just like, super synthy dance stuff, which is why recent weekend material I actually enjoy. I think Blinding Lights is kind of a jam. I'm kind of into it after not hearing it much before this. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there's a lot of cool, like a good material on here. And if you're a weekend fan, you already know what to expect. Um, but yeah, but yeah, you're right. Ultimately, this is a greatest hits collection and that's all this is. I mean, it's, it's not a bad greatest hits. No, 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 no. Yeah. Turns um, out he has some hits. I mean, there's a reason he performed at the Super Bowl. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, real quickly, if you were conf- if you were on YouTube and looked for Up and were confused by your results, <laughs> that's because Cardi B has a new uh, single called <laughs> Up. Yeah. Yeah. I listened to this thing. It seems like kind of like WAP. Yes. But did you watch it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Did you watch it with children? No. Good. No children Don't watch here. it with children. No, yeah, it's it's something. Uh, yeah, I think it's fun. It's a fun song. But yeah, I think a lot of people are going to be like this, think it's too close to WAP to be like its own thing. Yeah. So I think, but that might benefit it because it might actually get to ride the wave of that kind of success. But yeah, Cardi still can rap. Cardi's still great. So yep. there you go. Uh, I guess this does mean she will have an album out next month, maybe? I believe it's soon, yeah. Usually that's how that works. Okay. Now, you listened to two Media Boat favorites. I mean, well, yeah. one's my favorites, one's your favorite. Well, okay. So I'll try to make both of these very brief. Okay. Uh, what I'll say about the Foo uh, I'm going to do a one-sentence review of this Foo Fighters record. It's another Foo Fighters record. So if you like their stuff, <laughs> it's just more of their stuff. 
Yeah, I, I struggle to have anything else to say about it. It's very much like in their kind of vein. It's modern Foo Fighters. So if you've liked their last couple of records, it's no different than that. I mean, like you could even rewind what it kind of some of the stuff I said about um, Weezer last week with OK Human. A lot of this is like stands for this record where it's like they there's quotes from Dave Grohl about like, oh, yeah, we tried to do some dancier stuff this time. None of that shows in the actual record. It just sounds like Foo Fighters. So I don't know. It's your mileage may vary, but if you like the Foo Fighters, you might like this. So but I've really listened to the Foo Fighters since, I guess, Sonic Highway 2014. It's like that. In and off. It's like that. But see, that's where I fell off. Though. <laughs> exactly. So like I said, your mileage may vary. I'd ch try it out and see if it's like it tickles your fancy, but ultimately it's Foo Fighters doing Foo Fighters. It's like Dave Grohl is settled into a groove and this is definitely where it is. Okay. Um, so, the other thing that so I listen to. If you had to pick this as kind of their entry ticket to the Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, yay or nay? It's not strong enough. No, I think if they get in, it's on the the strength of their early material. The early material. I think. I mean, the band wrote Everlong. If that's not enough to get you into the freaking Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I don't know what there is. Um, it's a classic, and I will admit. You could that. say the same thing about Tina Turner. Yes, I know. That's the problem with the Hall of Fame is that there's too many good ones. Uh, but yeah, um, it is what it is. But this will not convert anybody who hasn't already been converted by just the nice guy that Dave Roll seems to be. All right. Now, um, also tell me about the nice to... girl that seems to be Haley Williams. Yeah, so I'm not going to write the whole name of this thing because it would be too long for my caption here. Um, but uh, she actually surprise announced this record um, after we recorded our podcast last week. This is a follow-up to her last record, um, Pedals, for, Pedals Armor. for Armor, which was 2020 release which I had middling thoughts about. I thought it was fine. I thought there were some interesting directions that she went with it. Um, but ultimately it was not something that stuck with me and I didn't really listen to it again after that first time. Well, her follow-up I think is actually better than the first one. Oh, um, that's good I'm, to hear. I'm happy to report that her new one, Flowers for Vases slash Desconsos um, is a much better record in my opinion. This is all self-recorded at home during quarantine. So she folklored this is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, and in kind of like folklore, it is choose a lot of the kind of stuff she was playing around with on Pedal for Armor, uh, Pedals for Armor, where there was a lot of synthy kind of 80s stuff, kind of residual production from that Paramore record after laughter. Um, that's all gone. This is mostly a intimate acoustic sounding record. The Paramore style guitars don't show up until the very last song. Like, so if you're expecting that kind of sound, you're not going to get it. But what you do get is better songwriting, I think. I think the lyrics here are the best she's written in her solo career so far. Um, I think that there's a lot of really interesting uh, songs dwelling on kind of this post marriage kind of weird miasma that she's in right now in her life and it does a better job of uh, I think of uh, like that kind of vibe than the last record did um, so yeah I had a really good time with this thing I'm gonna keep this I think um, keep this on uh, rotation because I'm really mm. enjoying it um, getting that, to get an idea of how, where this is going or where she's going with this I recommend the single off this record which is called My Limb so uh, check that My out limb. yeah and check that out and see if you like it. Uh, that's got good like kind of taster uh, for this record. Also, it's shorter than Pedal Pedal for Armor, Pedals for Armor, which is good because that thing was way too long. So she's this is a more concise, better written, I think, version of what she was trying to do before. All right, well that's good. I recommend it. Okay, so that's a media boat. Stream it then. It's a media boat. Stream it. One out of three. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're getting there. All righty. Speaking of getting there and wrapping it up, we are still technically under the two hour mark right now, so we can do it. We can do it. All right. I feel so games. bad for video games. We always rush through it. Uh, no, we don't. <laughs> video games. Uh, we have to do releases. We do. Yes. Including Gal Gun Returns <laughs> for the Switch and PC. 
<laughs> yeah. Little Nightmares 2 for the PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. And then a duo combo. Yeah. Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury for the Switch. Yeah, I've heard good things. It's a re-release of the 3D of uh, the Wii U game Super Mario 3D World. But then the v- Bowser's Fury add-on, from what I understand, is actually the star of the show uh, here. I've been hearing nothing but positive reactions from the press about this thing. It's like an open worldy kind of take on uh, Mario that incorporates a lot of 3D world stuff, but adds in some of the Odyssey stuff um, to have more of kind of like a mission-based kind of open world kind of thing. It sounds cool. And it's a little bite-sized thing that's only a few hours long, uh, which is good for people who want to get in and out with the new stuff. Um, So yeah, Switch owners, this seems like the next big thing to own. Unless you want to wait for Pokemon Snap. Yeah, yeah, before Pokemon Snap next month. Yep. Or April, sorry. April. Not next month, and month after. Right, you're just going to march straight through April. <laughs> That's what we always do. Yes, it is. All right, uh, let's get into the video game news. And hey, it's not that time of year again, but it's close. <laughs> E3, just around the corner. Yeah, sort of. Maybe. The Entertainment Software Association, ESA, has confirmed that it's planning a digital E3 2021 this June. In the statement to Games Radar, the ESA lays out plans for this year's E3, writing, quote, we can confirm that we are transforming the E3 experience for 2021 and will soon share exact details on how we're bringing the global video community, global video game community together. We have great conversations with publishers developers, and companies across the board, and we look forward to sharing details about their involvement soon. This sounds similar to what the Academy Awards are doing, what the mm-hmm. Globes are doing, what the Grammys are doing, is they are changing it up. Granted that E3 last year had to be fully canceled. Yeah, I think this is a smart pivot because if you're the ESA, you're probably mad that E3 more or less happened without them last year. So when they canceled the physical show, they didn't have a digital show that was branded as E3. Instead, they kind of left it to Jeff Keighley and the game sites to kind of make their own like arrangements with publishers and developers to stream their content there. So this move suggests that the ESA wants that E3 branding first and foremost again. Mm-hmm. So they're going to, so it's not really to the end, like to the average person like you and me, not going to be too much different than last year, except maybe there'll be more of a condensed schedule like there was in the old days when E3 was a physical event. So unlike last year, because the one of the problems with last year was because of that freedom, the announcements were spread out from like... We had E3 month. Yeah, from like June to all the way to, to September. Yep. Stuff was still trickling out. If the if ESA has their way and they're able to make deals with everybody, they're gonna compartmentalize like compartmentalize everything back into July like they want. Okay, um, E3 has two big conventions to learn from. Mm-hmm. Uh, DC Fandom, yeah, and Comic Con, which all went online and digital and streaming, and exactly like these digital press conferences, right. They have examples they can learn from. They're not the first. They're no longer the first. They had the chance to be, but they blew it. So this is, yeah, this is ultimately their last, I think, their last kind of grasp at, like, relevance, right? It's like, if they can't pull this off this year, then it's guaranteed pretty much that the ESA might bury E3 Mm -hmm. as a name. Uh, If they can, though, it reminds people that there was an E3 in the first place and prints the seeds of there possibly being a real one again next year. But chances of that happening seem slimmer uh, with just all the bad will that they've sown over the last few years. So I don't know. I don't know if they can pull this off, especially in an era where Jeff Keighley can, you know, twiddle his fingers and have all the companies do whatever he wants them to do. You know, this would be a great platform if it was on TV, like a gaming network just for free coverage. Too bad we don't have one of those right now. (laughs) No, not since the incident. <laughs> not since the incident. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. If they could do a deal with G four, that seems right 
Like that would be the pl thing, the place to do a deal. Um, or snatch up Jeff Keeley himself. Why not go for the big dog, right? Like if they can make a deal with him, then he can get all the connections that they want. It's just, the question is, does Jeff want to work with E3? I would probably say no. <laughs> no, but we would like to work with E3 and G4. <laughs> so shoot us an email at mediaboatpodcast at gmail.com and we will yeah. be there for you. To sure, cover we'll everything. see. Something like that. All right, what else do we got? Uh, last up, um, oh, ZeniMax. We talked about how yeah. it's a CEO kind of a, did the big one. Yeah. Well, Microsoft says it's creating a new subsidiary company called Vault as part of its acquisition of ZeniMax. Legal documents displayed on European law website EUR-LEX state that Microsoft will acquire, quote, sole control of the whole of ZeniMax. That process will be accomplished via a newly created Microsoft subsidiary titled Vault, which will be merged with and into ZeniMax. <laughs> it's not clear exactly what the new company's role will be, but it does sound as though Vault will be the new home for ZeniMax's studios, including Bethesda, Arcane, id Software, and Machine Games, all within Microsoft. That in, or sorry, that what impact that might have is difficult to tell. It could mean it could be a means of Microsoft exercising more control over its new studios, but it might also be a way to ensure some extra independence, as it looks as though the acquired teams won't be included under the Xbox Game Studios banner, like some of the company's other recent acquisitions. Yeah. Vault does indeed come from the Fallout series. Right. And it does, I mean, which is Bethesda. And that does kind of make sense as a, they have their own quote unquote Disney vault to <laughs> house all of these uh, companies within. Yeah. It's an interesting story because of the questions that it kind of leaves. It doesn't answer a whole lot, but it definitely proposes more like who the hell knows what's going to happen. One of them, like one of the questions is, is like, yeah, is the story brings up is like, wait a minute. So they're not going to be under Xbox Game Studios. So why are they kind of compartmentalizing into their own kind of division? And the easy answer is, is that this, for all those people who are crossing their fingers that Bethesda games come out on other platforms, this is hope for them, right? If you don't have Microsoft on the, the label, it's easier for somebody to like, for, for them to let ZeniMax just put out Fallout or Elder Scrolls on a PlayStation. It's not, it doesn't have the baggage at that point. And the right, end user doesn't have know. The show debacle where you have mm -hmm. PlayStation game studios on an Xbox <laughs> uh, console or uh, yeah. it, uh, cover. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that maybe there was some skeptic skepticism on ZeniMax's part about how independent they would be from Microsoft's control. And so this gives them maybe the, the, like the peace of mind that they'll be able to do their own things, kind of like a Blizzard Activision kind of scenario where they have equal billing because of how they wanted to make sure that Activision remained independent, or sorry, Blizzard remained independent. That could be what they're talking about here as well. But ultimately we don't know for sure what the actual reality of this will be until it starts happening. I think we're both missing the big part here, which is <laughs> this is European law website. Right. The thing about it being the EU site is that they don't like monopolies. I Having do. ZeniMax, a part of Microsoft, could be seen as a huge chunk of the monopoly in video games and software sales. Mm. By putting it under a separate company, it's Microsoft saying that they run their own show. We are hands off. They might be a subsidiary, but they do their own thing. We're just the parent company, much like a angel investor hedge fund would be to any other company. Mm, okay. Yeah. I didn't think about that angle. You're, you're right. They're a lot more litigious over uh, possible monopoly monopolies over there. So I don't know if this is international, if this will affect the U S as well, who knows? Right. Uh, I mean, the fact that it is European law kind of pulls out at me 
that yeah. this is for the EU market and not necessarily the North American market? It's certainly possible, but you would think that if they're going to have this branding at all, they would keep it everywhere. But I don't know. Uh, jury's out. We'll have to wait and see what happens. Right, but it is. it sounds like a very legal move for Microsoft to do. It might be. All right. All right. Last but not hours. least, I believe you played a video game. Oh, yeah. I did play a video game. Um, real quickly. So last week, I mentioned that I was going to play Control because it's the new free game on PlayStation Plus. Yeah. Well, there was also a free game on PlayStation Plus that I decided to play first, thinking, eh, I'll see it, play this an hour, see what happens. I might yeah. bounce off it. No. It's got you. It got me. You rubbed the it's, lamp. You rubbed the lamp and you liked what you saw. It got me. Uh, <laughs> I beat it. I'm looking forward to platinuming this game. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's my pitch for you to play this game now. Tell me it's, about this Concrete Genie. It's that good. Concrete Genie. So remember the game, uh, speaking of E3s, uh, 2017 called Entwined that was announced and released the same day. Yeah. That's this company. This okay. is their follow-up, Concrete Genie. It is a very artsy video game that has some very deep uh, emotional impacting uh, characters that are hooligans, but, you know, hooligans in the sense that they come from some very broken and kind of not perfect families. And you kind of go through that with each character that you meet. Uh, your name is Ash. You play as this artist who hangs out with them, but you're not really a part of their group. Um, and you're sucked into this fantastical world uh, where your drawings come to life and help you out. But their concrete drawings, or as the name implies, Concrete Genie, they're only applicable to the walls. Mm -hmm. they, uh, and they help you solve puzzles. So it does a good job of making the characters very creative. You can create them any way you want. There's no wrong answer in creating them. Okay. There's puzzles that you have to solve, which I love. And the level design, which has you go forwards into a level. And then you have to turn around and go backwards out the level it's very smart it's very smartly done like that i love it when video games do that where you spend this whole time going forward only for you to turn around and have to go backwards to where you start with added obstacles in the way mm -hmm. um it very ca it captivated me because of the storytelling they're very good at storytelling here not a whole lot of words are said a lot of it is shown in pictures and artwork but it's very emotional and kind of hits you right in the heart as being a former rambunctious child, as I hear Snickers <laughs> in the background. <laughs> <laughs> former? I'm not sure. <laughs> I had a life before you. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it kind of hits on some of those notes correctly. And the artwork and puzzles are really the main standout here because it's very good. Like I said, it sucked me in. I could see how people can bounce off this, mm -hmm. but give it about an hour, hour and a half into it. And the puzzles aren't very difficult to solve. Like I've never had, to, didn't have to go and check online to see how to solve a puzzle. Because they're all very pretty much solvable. Just you're trying to call your genie over to solve it but how you do it and hit the timing correctly is very smartly done. And I applaud mm. them for what they did. Definitely check it out. Uh, this game technically was released at the end of 2018, I believe. Mm -hmm. Like October of 2018, I went and looked it up because that's how kind of invested I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm kind of glad that I played this game. It's one, it's one of those games where you're like, yeah, that was a good game. I'm glad I played that. Kind of like how we did with uh, Edith Finch. Yeah. Where it's a good game. It's kind of a quick playthrough. I think I beat it in two sittings. Uh, about 10 hours in total. Uh, so yeah, definitely check it out. Concrete Genie. 
and I'll probably get to control if I can next week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, these are technically 2020 games or, but yeah, still, still it's, it's, uh, it's, it's free. So it's, it's free. So it counts. Yeah. It's in the news now. Yeah. All right. Well, I didn't play anything. So that I believe. Well, that's good. Cause this is the two hour mark for us. We'll do it. So thank you for joining us for this week's edition of the media vote podcast. We'll be back next week for another show. If you want to see the archived video versions of our podcast, you can go to YouTube, search Media Boat Podcast, find our page, like, subscribe, comment, whatever you want to do, click on the bell for notifications, etc. If you want to hear the audio version, we're on all sorts of podcast services such as Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, anywhere you, where you listen to your podcast, just search Media Boat Podcast. You can also find us on social media on Twitter. Our handle is at Media Boatcast. Facebook, search our name for our page, like and comment there as well. If you have any questions, comments to us directly, you can email us at mediaboatpodcast at gmail.com. And you can see some of our archived writing at mediaboatpodcast.com as well. That, I believe, will do it. If you wanted to join some of our discussion, we have Discord. Just yeah. search for Media Boat Podcast on Discord as well. Yeah. Um, Twitch media boat on Twitch. Yeah. Or when we're playing games, or if I'm playing games with random people online, trying to drive them to listen to us, (laughs) may or may not be working. Please tell us in the comments. All righty. Well, thanks for listening. We'll be back next week. In the meantime, wear uh, two masks while you're outside. CDC, as of today, says that's a good idea. So, um, or stay inside and watch Daytona. Exactly, and watch Daytona or play Daytona USA on your uh, Saturn. Yeehaw. All right, see you guys next week. Okay, bye. Bye bye.